All right, let's get started. Okay, so hello and welcome. My name is Matthew Poltak. I, uh, I will be your host and moderator today. And thank you for joining us for Neoscope's second installment to our Webinar Wednesday series. Due to high demand, we decided to go ahead and do a second installment of our security, our information security webinar. Uh, these webinars are just one of many resources available to you on our new website, www.neoscopeit.com. So Neoscope Technology Solutions is a managed service provider that specializes in tailored IT services and solutions for businesses throughout New England. Our experienced IT team is dedicated to helping you increase productivity and decrease downtime, all for a flat rate monthly cost. <clears throat> like I said, today's topic is information security and the eight measures your business cannot afford to ignore. But before we start, I would like to introduce today's presenter, Craig Taylor. Taylor has spent 20 plus years of his professional career directing information security teams within Fortune 500 companies across different industries. He has experience in developing defense in-depth security programs and has a long history of successful compliance audits. As Neoscope's chief security officer, Taylor has led the development of our managed security option, the Neoscope Shield, which he will provide more information on later. Before I hand the mic over to Craig to start, um, if you do have any questions, there is a question box you can submit those questions into. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for me to moderate and check those questions and um, feed them to Craig to answer. So Craig, if you have anything to say before you get started. No, Matt, that's great. I thank you for that introduction and uh, welcome to all of you on the bridge uh, and on the webinar. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday or WWW. Um, we're going to be talking today about cybersecurity trends and breaches. Um, I'm going to see if I have that agenda slide. We'll bring that up. <clears throat> cybersecurity breach trends. We'll talk briefly about cybercrime, the importance of the first step being a risk assessment, and how that risk assessment needs to lead into follow, you know, policy, governance, uh, training your people, and the different technologies that have been put in place to protect your organization as well as new uh, new technologies that are coming out uh, to help us thwart hacker attacks. And we'll spend just a brief couple of slides on the Neoscope Shield, which sort of blends all this together into a package to protect our clients here at Neoscope. So without further ado, let's talk about the breaches that we've heard and the trends that we're seeing in the industry. For many years now, we've heard about massive computer breaches in the news. This one here was, I guess you would have to guess, is Target. Uh, Home Depot had a major security breach last year. Also, um, Sony Pictures was the recipient of a massive hack attack when they published a, a uh, unflattering North Korean uh, movie. Uh, and Michaels was also uh, breached heavily. Another large company, but some years ago in 2008, TGX, was breached, and, and this slide gives you an indication um, of what the impact to a company, a large Fortune 100 company is for a cybersecurity breach. If you look at the circle there, that's the you know, sum total impact to TGX companies, so a, a temporary blip before the stock tripled and quadrupled uh, up until today. Uh, this all might give you a false sense of security within the SMB marketplace, though, because the Statistics are very different, tell a very different story. The National Cybersecurity Alliance um, published a study that said 60% of small businesses go out of business uh, within six months of a breach, a data breach. So the impact on small to medium-sized firms is much, much different than those of the largest companies of the world, the, the Fortune 500, the banks that might be too big to fail, as you recall, from 2008. Why might this be, though? What, what's, the, what's the cause of these small to medium-sized business going out of, out of business from a breach. Well, you know, in a short run, your business is negatively impacted in the sense that it can't operate. It can't produce or deliver the goods and services that it's meant to deliver in the initial days, weeks after a breach. In the midterm impact of small businesses, you know, you're losing new business. New companies are not signing orders with you because they've heard of the breach. They, you've lost some reputation. Uh, on what you do and how you protect your data. And that has a, a, a pretty significant impact on your business moving forward. And then in the long term, obviously without the short-term revenue, the mid-term revenue in the long term, it can have a devastating 
impact on your business to the point of going out of business. Um, let's talk about w what's going on in terms of who's being attacked when. Despite the news articles on the biggest companies of the world being breached, that really misrepresents things because as you can see in these trends on the left hand side, uh, the Verizon, I'll see if I have this little ability here. Yeah, so that should work. Um, on this side here, maybe, oops, excuse me for one second, I come back. I'm trying to highlight something. We'll see if I can do that. I guess not. But um, in 2011, 18% of the attacks against, uh, that were recorded in breaches across the world were against SMBs. In 2012, that rose to 36. In 13, it was 41%. And actually, the last figure I saw from the Verizon uh, Longitudinal Data Breach Study from 2014 was that 71% of the attacks or breaches were in companies with less than 100 employees. Summarized differently, on the right-hand side of this slide, if you are in a company with 11 to 100 employees, you're 15 times more likely to be targeted and attacked and successfully breached um, than larger companies, despite what you hear of Sony and Target and Home Depot, um, versus the smallest companies, which are under less attack. Um, and the question that comes to my mind is why? Why would small to medium-sized businesses be more likely to be attacked? So let's take a look at some of those reasons on this next slide. The first thing that happens is a lack of time. Many of the customers that I talk to have no time to deal with security. The second issue is budget, financing. They do not have the deep pockets that a bank might have for some of the most sophisticated and elaborate uh, technologies the forced training on 15 different ways to protect your company at a bank that I, I remember going through at the, the bank I worked for, uh, and the, the dollars to spend on hiring staff. It's an inter it's, it's, so the budget just doesn't exist in the small to medium-sized businesses for all of the elaborate technology. Um, security expertise is something that most staff at a small to medium-sized business, you're lucky if you have one person that does security. Uh, most often there's no one whose role it is. Uh, there's, so that, that's a lack or, or a, um, a weakness in this SMB marketplace for, uh, which is exploited by attacks and hackers. There's very little security awareness training typically in the companies that I go and talk to about uh, information security needs. And, and this is really one of the cases where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Just a little bit of training would go so far, so, so far on protecting these SMBs, but it's not there. And finally, um, the security staff just don't exist. They're not able to hire a, a job, a full-time position that whose only role is security, um, is, is security and protecting the business and the data that's in that business. These are a lot of the shortcomings that we find in small businesses that make them a big target, uh, a big bullseye on their on their chest for attack by hackers. But there's one more, and that is that some of these small businesses are the way into the larger firms. In the case of Target's attack, um, they, the hackers went in through the smaller HVAC vendor, the SMB that did delivered HVAC services to Target, compromised that company's computer systems and networks, and then used the backdoor trust relationship to Target that that vendor had to compromise Target. Look at some of the different forms of, of um, crime, cyber crime that is out there, some examples. The first that we're seeing quite regularly in these last few um, months and years is ransomware. And in fact, with the launch of Windows 10 uh, recently on July 29th, I myself have seen two to three different um, phishing campaigns where a fake upgrade to Windows 10 is sent in a phishing email and it entices users to click on it to open a zip file and infect themselves, unfortunately, with CryptoLocker, which then ransoms the, the, the data that's on that drive or on the shared drive in a, in a server um, for ransom. You have to pay the $300 if you want to get your files back. Fortunately for Neoscope, all of our clients are on a backup schedule that allows us to restore that data from the last known good backup, which means you're down for a day, you've lost your work for that day, you have to restore from yesterday's backup. Um, it can be a lot worse for some companies and some individuals that have no backup solution in place. Another area uh, of cyber crime activity is the bot, uh, sorry, the uh, remote access Trojans, 
which can get installed on systems to grant hackers uh, remote access, like a VPN access, into your computer systems and network. And they can spy on your activity. They can exfiltrate data, steal your intellectual property, your HIPAA data, your employee HR data, uh, your PCI account information. Um, and lead to a, da a significant data breach. This is one of the worst when, they, when there's a rat or an advanced persistent threat in your network. Another form of attack is uh, when a computer is compromised in such a way that it's meant to participate in a bot network. We may have heard in the news uh, the term botnet. Well, this is nothing more than a hacker who has a herd of compromised computers all over the world. Uh, it can be as few as a dozen to as many as millions. There was a zoo spot net that was purportedly more than a million strong that is then used to target other companies in denial of service attacks, foreign governments, uh, or the US government in a distributed denial of service attack. Um, all of this, it can be known and considered cyber crime. Let's move on. So what is a small business or a medium business to do? Well, the first thing of the eight that we talk about with our clients is the importance of getting a risk assessment. Sun Tzu wrote a book many years ago about warfare, and one of his truisms is very true today in the cybersecurity space. He wrote, every battle is won before it is fought. And what he means, what that means to me, and what I hope we can convey to you, is that preparation and knowing your strengths, your risks or weaknesses against you, your threats and vulnerabilities, is really critical to your success when you're under attack. It's no longer um, a case of whether you'll be attacked. It's just a case of when. And uh, if you don't know what your weaknesses are, you've already lost the battle before it's even begun. <clears throat> and to weigh, the way to understand your strengths, your weaknesses, the threats and vulnerabilities against you is to conduct a risk assessment. The first step in a risk assessment is to examine what your, to think like a criminal really. What data would I want to steal from me? And where does that data sit in my company at rest or in motion? Um, at rest, you might be thinking in uh, structured databases, uh, unstructured file repositories on servers. Uh, when you think about data in motion, think about an example in, say, a hospital where it has uh, patient records and people are coming and creating that data as they come into the uh, doctor's office, offices at remote locations. So that data is in motion because it's coming into the person walking into the office, they're putting it into the computer system through the terminal, either themselves or through the uh, receptionist there or the nurse, and then that data gets moved over the VPN from that remote site over into say, a structured database. Um, it's also in motion, though, when it gets backed up to tape uh, at the end of that day or week and shipped off to maybe an Iron Mountain site. So the motion is also as it leaves your organization. Other places, data, critical and sensitive data could leave your organization in motion. It shouldn't, but it does. We find it all the time when we're doing assessments is in email and website usage. Uh, where people just don't realize that the sensitive information they have, credit cards, healthcare records, anything like that, should never be emailed. That's a unencrypted, almost like consider putting it in the local newspaper is what email is. It's, it's uh, very wide open. So once you've identified all your sensitive data that's at rest and in motion in your organization, you need to look at that data and, and, and assess what the threats and vulnerabilities to that data are. Let's define what threats and vulnerabilities mean. So if you're walking down a dark alley and someone pops out with a knife, the threat against you is the actor, the person with a knife. He's a clear threat to you. Now, your vulnerabilities would be how much martial arts training you have. If you're, you know, if, if, let's go back in the days of knights and, and uh, barbarians. And if you have armor on, your vulnerabilities might be between the plates of breast mail or, you know, what your specific vulnerabilities in your um, your own personal protection are. If you're a police officer, are you wearing your Kevlar vest that night so you're vulnerable, you're, you, you're not vulnerable to a, shot, a gunshot to the chest or you aren't wearing it and you're vulnerable to it. So the threats are the actors out there who are perpetrating crimes and attacking us 
and the vulnerabilities are our weaknesses. To translate in, that into computer and uh, technology speak, what patches don't we have installed on our servers that might leave us vulnerable to an attack of one kind or another? What employees haven't been trained to spot a phishing email and they're likely to click on a crypto locker link? Those are vulnerabilities. And those are all identified through a risk assessment. The next thing we do in the risk assessment is we ask ourselves, I coming out to you and interview uh, folks at different sites, I say, okay, how likely do you think this threat is? In the case of CryptoLocker, you know, I'm often asking that case, and I know the answer, we've seen it already impact a particular client. So it's 100% likely. Now the next question is, what would the impact be? During the risk assessment, we, design, we, we look at your company, we say, hmm, you have a good backup plan here. So the impact of a crypto locker would be a day's lost wages, a uh, uh, labor, and uh, the you know having to restore it yesterday's. No backup, and that impact and could be enormous. You could lose. And I know a friend of mine lost forty-five thousand pictures and fifteen years of you know cherished memories because of a crypto locker uh, that he refused to pay the ransom on. He, and, and I advised him to not pay it if he couldn't, if he if he could help it, because once you pay that first three hundred dollar um, crypto locker uh, key recovery fee, first you have to know how to use bit bitcoins and things like that. But once you pay them, you are now ten times more likely to be attacked again and again and again. It's like you pay it once and you get attacked over and over again. So you're just ruining your future life because you'll be attacked over and over with more and more sophisticated phishing attacks. So it's just a, it's just something to be avoided. You don't negotiate with terrorists. You don't pay crypto locker um, things. So moving on, what the output of a risk assessment, once we've looked at these four items, we get a, a risk matrices here which has you know everything from acceptable risks that are low likelihood, low impact, or low severity to these medium yellows where we want to put some mitigating control in place, either technology or training or policy based. And the, the ones that are unacceptable, you absolutely have to implement some fix for them in the short term. You know, and uh, each risk is unique, has to be uh, eliminated in its own way if it's a high risk, high impact risk, high, high, high risk and high likelihood um, threat or vulnerability to your environment. Hopefully that's clear. We'll move on now. Um, the next seven uh, ways to protect your business. Remember, the first is the risk assessment. The next seven ways all have to do with policies and governance, tr people and training, and technology. So let's move into these areas to see how these three pillars of information security can be used to protect your business. The first one is policies. Uh, so we'll, let's let's just go over this briefly. We'll get the uh, remind everybody. One is the risk assessment, always step one. Two is governing your policy, your employees, and their actions. Three is training your people on best practices around security. And four through eight will be the technology, and we'll get into these in just a moment. So this is the agenda for the rest of today's webinar. Policy compliance. A lot of companies, when I go in and walk in, are talking about using paper uh, signatures on their policy. So when you start at their company, you get a 60-page employee handbook, you sign your last page, you hand that in, and you're done. And, and really, do you ever really read through that employee handbook? You may reference it for the summer dress code uh, that's in there or the mileage reimbursement if you're traveling on company business, but you really don't read it. And it's not too useful, and it's all done on paper, and remote employees have to get FedEx, and then that paper has to come back. It's filed in a folder somewhere that might not ever be found again. Uh, it's a real pain in the, in the butt for many and most companies, and takes a lot of time for the human resources or the office manager. So any policy compliance work that you do with your company should be automated instead. It should include robust tracking and reporting. And the only way to do that is to do it through a database and an electronic application, maybe a software as a service that can eliminate paper tracking and filing and, and be easily used for both targeting employees to accept different policies, to enable rewriting those policies when you need to make changes and reapplying them to your employees so they can update their knowledge on what they need to do. And uh, 
goes through automation to send out automatic reminders to employees to read the policy. It's a year annual thing. You want to have these policies put in place in front of employees on an annual or regular basis at a minimum. All of this will help provide your employees the governance that they need to know what they're supposed to do on the job. Most employees, the vast majority, will do what is expected of them if they know what it is. And a 60-page employee handbook doesn't cut it anymore these days. So let's show you what Neoscope has done briefly. We've partnered with a company called Policy Services LLC. And uh, this is quite simple to set up. I think it takes about an hour. There's no manual for this website. There's a tutorial, which you can see in the upper right-hand side. It's, I think it's five minutes or less that explains how you set up policies in the Policy Services website. Here's the Neoscope policies that we have in place. We do have a handbook. We have an intern policy, an incident policy, information handling, password with. If you have any privileged information on a Massachusetts resident, you have to, by Massachusetts privacy laws, have a written information security policy. That's a WISP. Uh, and then uh, finally, an acceptable use policy. This is a very simple way to administer policies uh, through the site to all of the Neoscope employees. What happens next, you have to manage users through the user administration page on this page. You upload them through a CSV file. You can add, add different groups. Here's one group for Neoscope, which is all users. Um, I did this at a, um, a town recently where they have a fire department with different SOPs or standard operating procedures. They have a um, police department with different SOPs. And the HR department has applies to everybody. So they created different groups. They assigned different policies to each group depending on what was applicable. Um, the third thing you need, as mentioned, was reporting. And you can see here that Neoscope has a pretty high percentage of compliance with all of their, past, all their policies. I do know that the security incident policy and employee handbook were recently updated on their annual review and republished to employees. So there's a period of performance that we allow for accepting this of 30 days. Uh, we're still within that period right now, um, but I bet you if I checked today, I, we would be over 100%. This, is, uh, this screenshot came from just over a week ago. But it's very easy here for me to look up under a top right user lookup. I can pick any employee, click the, put their name in, first name, last name, and see their client status across all these policies. Auditor comes in, and they're real excited about seeing this stuff. They, it just, they're tremendously excited uh, about how serious our security program is. And quite frankly, our clients are also auditing us on these aspects of our on all aspects of our security program. Many customers or clients of ours now want to know that we're protecting ourselves so that we aren't compromising their business. And they're coming in and doing audits. And this site allows us to pass those audits with those flying colors. Moving on to the third item is people. Right? When you talk about training your people, this is again that ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. One of the biggest areas of internet threats is weak passwords. Time and again, I see employees using the same password, and it's a very basic, simple password on their Facebook account, on their LinkedIn account, on their Yahoo or Gmail account, and their desktop laptop login. And so they're putting the company at risk by reusing not even a strong password, a weak password. So if it's cracked or hacked anywhere, it's used everywhere else. So we go over and when we train people on how to pick a better password, a strong password, a, a mnemonic-based password, which is a memorable, hard-to-guess password, hard-to-crack password. We talk about phishing and how a simple check of the URL that you're trying to connect to in any email that wants you to do something urgently if you just check the URL that you're about to link to in that link or click here or any of the, the uh, phishing email links, check those out because it's probably not PayPal if it wants you to update your account because it's been compromised and, uh, or you know, a free Windows 10 upgrade but open this zip file. Those are phishing emails and they're just going to cause pain, suffering, and misery for you and your company. So we train people in our training on how to avoid phishing attacks. Talk about malware and the different forms of malware that I explained earlier today, but other forms such as, um, um, well, what are some of the other forms that we talk of malware? Well, there's password crackers and there's, um, 
there's the remote access Trojan, there's drive-by downloads. The other thing we could talk about is the drive-by downloads that are now infecting legitimate websites through the advertisement networks that these websites trust. Just the other day, I read a uh, Sophos uh, antivirus blog posting about a Hugo Boss graphic that was uh, had a zero-day vulnerability at, uh, uh, attacking Flash or something of that nature, which compromised anyone that saw the advertisement on their desktop. They didn't have to do anything except visit a website that pulled, published that Hugo Boss ad to them. Really quite unfortunate, but that would then you know, click off a drive-by download, which would then download some other malware and install it on your computer and either crypto locker it or participate in a bot network or install a remote access Trojan. Some bad stuff occurred. So our training goes over all of these and many other uh, tidbits of information that are useful, not only in the business world, but in your personal lives on how to protect your private information. Um, so let's move into items four through eight, the technology protections, the first of which every company needs an anti-spam and an anti-phishing technology in place to block as many of those phishing attack emails that come in as possible to eliminate the, the temptation from employees clicking on links. Because you know, without training and reinforcement, uh, studies have shown that you're, out of 10 employees, you're going to get between five and eight clicking on a a well-crafted phishing link um, without any training if they haven't been trained. So you need to eliminate as many of those uh, five to eight emails out of ten um, from ever arriving into the inbox uh, or the spam messages for productivity purposes. You also need good solid antivirus and anti-malware products. Now Neoscope partners with Continuum and has the uh, antivirus solution out there. Uh, WebRoot and, and um, Malwarebytes to help protect our uh, clients' products. Uh, that is out there to protect the systems, and every company needs to have an antivirus and an anti-malware product installed to help re uh, reactively protect against known attack signatures. The unfortunate part, though, is that the antivirus vendors aren't keeping up today with the 50 to 100,000 new virus variants that are written. Here's how virus writers operate. They write a virus, they obfuscate the code or, or jumble the code all up uh, in such a way that it is indistinguishable or it doesn't match the signatures that have been built into any of the top 55 virus vendors. They'll even test it in a virtual farm on Amazon or on a software as a service site. They'll check their, their malicious code against all the different antivirus vendors to make sure it doesn't trigger an alert and then they send it out in their phishing emails to try and infect sites in different places. And the antivirus vendors, they get these submissions through the web uh, and they write new signatures, but they're always a day late. So the truth is today, antivirus is completely ineffective in stopping all the threats that it used to be very effective at threatening, uh, at, at protecting against. So where do we turn as small businesses? What's the most economical and best next step to protect our environment? Well, we already have the firewall. We have the antivirus. We have the anti-spam. We talked briefly about training and policy compliance. DNS is the next layer of security services. And Neoscope has partnered with uh, OpenDNS to provide web protection and content filtering um, on all of the uh, various ports and protocols that would do connect you to the internet that could be a venue for attack. Um, well, then moving on, DNS is the next layer of protection for web protection and content filtering, and this is actually one of the slickest, newest technologies that I'm, I'm very excited to be talking about with our clients because it's, it doesn't in cost any latency in the connections. It's very efficient and it's very effective at blocking malware content. Before I get into DNS as a protection, let's talk about what others are saying about antivirus for a moment. Uh, this January, Gartner published a buyer's guide to antivirus saying that it's only 20 to 50 percent effective on new threats against computers, the daily low volume threat. Worse, Symantec's SVP, Brian Dye, said antivirus is dead. I think that's a little overblown. I think the antivirus is still an absolute critical part of any desktop security program, to the point I, I see it much more like Eugene Kaspersky, and Kaspersky uh, is another antivirus product, 
He likens antivirus to the seatbelt in your car. It's very important, and you would always wear your seatbelt when you're in the car, but there are other things now like airbags and crumple zones and heads-up displays or, or uh, early warnings on, um, you know, you're too following too close and a, a light flashes on your dash. That, that happens in my, uh, in my Honda Accord now, so it alerts us. All of those things combined provide better protection for me, to me. All right. So that's antivirus moving to the DNS protection. This is the next level or next layer of protection that we can put on top of the anti-spam, the anti-malware, and the antivirus technologies that are out there. What, what DNS protection does is it prevents malware from ever getting installed on your computer. When an, an, a phishing email comes into your site, here's what happens. An individual that hasn't been trained says, ooh, I have to go fix my PayPal account. Let me click on that link. That link does a DNS lookup to a compromised website and connects your desktop to download the crypto locker infection or whatever it might be malware-wise from a website on the Internet. Now, the fact that DNS and uh, our business partner, OpenDNS, serves 80 billion DNS packets a day, it can decide for you automatically based on its heuristics and its big data analysis that, hey, that website has been seeing thousands and thousands of hits today. It's got malware on it because yesterday it only had 100 hits, and every day for the last month it's had 100 hits. So we're not going to give you the IP address of that website that's been compromised and is hosting malware. We're going to give you a block page, and we prevent the infection through DNS from hitting your desktop. It's fantastic, and it and it you know it's not perfect. I'm not suggesting it works 100% of the time. Threats emerge quickly, and sometimes you might be the unlucky first person. But in many many cases, eight out of ten times, that malware infection is prevented when someone clicks on one of those malicious links in an email or in a drive-by download at a website you're visiting. Because when you go to any website, you know your computer is creating 10, 20, 50 connections to different websites to fill that page with advertisements and different content, you can block the malware from that page. So it pre prevents all of that infection from occurring. In the outbound direction, when you have a compromised computer on your network at your business, and it goes to check in with a command and control computer to say, what are my instructions for today? Who do I go and attack? Well, DNS will prevent that request from making it to that command and control server because they know where many of those are. Through intelligence sharing with many other virus vendors, the DNS vendor can block uh, access to those command and control networks and contain botnets within your network. Finally, you can enab enable and block content um, in your site with simple DNS queries. So you can block all sorts of inappropriate sites, whether it be gambling or pornography or hate literature or tasteless websites, improving both productivity in your site uh, with your employees as well as um, avoiding costly lawsuits when you know someone walks by a computer and uh, feels like they're working in an unsafe environment uh, because there's pornography on the screen or in illegitimate content is there. So you can block all of that. Um, all of this comes for a very low cost, too, because DNS is essentially pretty, pretty cheap for us to implement. Moving on to items 6, 7, and 8, the next uh, acts, uh, you know, action that a, a business must take to protect itself in this, today's day and age is within the mobile device space. Right now, our corporate environments, our, our business environments are awash in Android phones and iPhones and laptops and iPads and tablets and you name it. All of those have, carry around with them gigabits of data potentially. And the ability to remotely wipe a device and manage it is critical to your success as a company. So when you're looking at MDM software, just a quick refresher on what you need to watch for and have in your solution. You need to be able to remotely wipe that device. So when someone loses it or it's stolen or they leave the company, you can delete anything related to your company data that might be on that. It could be all the business contacts. It could be the email. It could be the calendar entries. But it needs to be remotely wiped. 
you need to force the device to be locked so that as it's left around the house, people can pick it up or at a bar uh, and look through you know, critical and sensitive data because it's not locked. And not only that, you have to require strong passwords. Another bit of advice I give to all the companies I consult with is to separate the guest network and the company's internal network so that you're not putting these mobile devices onto the company's internal network. You can create this DMZ so that visiting business professionals or vendors or guests of your company can get online to check their email to get their internet access but it's not on your internal corporate network. That's another good step uh, and best practice in mobile device management today. Moving on to seven, here's an interesting one, uh, laptop encryption. There's this website called the Wall of Shame for healthcare providers. Any healthcare provider that's had a breach of 500 or more records must report that breach to the uh, OMB, and they have a website that they keep those statistics publicly available. This has been going on since 2006. If you analyze every breach and the number of records breached, you see that 33% of the records breached all time relate to laptops. But only 9% of the last 100 breaches were laptop related. What does that mean? It means companies with critical and sensitive data, such as healthcare records, are encrypting those laptops. Therefore, when one is stolen or lost or confiscated at the border crossing, it's not the data that's compromised, but the $2,000 or $1,000 laptop alone. And it's not a reportable offense if the laptop with encryption, and you have to be able to prove it was encrypted. Uh, and if you can, then it's not a reportable offense. Um, so laptop encryption is a big one. It's very mature technology. You don't even notice the 2 to 5% uh, performance hit that it, it costs uh, when implemented. The eighth uh, and final step that I'm recommending customers do to their environments or to protect their data and their businesses is multi-factor authentication. Because we know that even with training, employees still pick weak passwords and the same password between devices when you can't set up a mandatory control there, um, through an SSO or some other thing, is multi-factor. Having something you know, which is typically a PIN or a password, with something you have, a token or a smart card or um, an application on your smartphone, uh, or something you are, we're all familiar with the iPhone fingerprint reader, the thumb, thumbprint reader where you can unlock your iPhone with that. That's a biometric control. Uh, and after you reboot your phone, you can't just use that to unlock it. You have to put the passcode in. So it's multi-factor to get into an iPhone today. That is what we, we need to see on companies that have remote access into their, into their uh, HIPAA data, their PCI data, their intellectual property. It's the gold standard. And it should be in place for all remote access and access to all critical uh, SAAS applications that are in the cloud that you enable for your employees. SAAS is software as a service. So think of Salesforce uh, as one of the more popular ones, or Microsoft Office Online. Enabling multi-factor authentication into these is a great step, and uh, in most cases, the gold standard for uh, protecting that data. So without further ado, uh, and conducting a time check here, I believe we have just a few minutes left. I want to introduce the Neoscope Shield in the next two slides, and then open it up to questions. So when I came aboard Neoscope about three months ago, uh, I recognized my hire, first of all, Tim Martin hired me because his businesses and all of his clients were under attack. There were crypto locker infections that people were clicking on phishing emails. They weren't trained. They didn't have all the technologies that they needed to fight. Certainly, they had anti-spam and anti-virus, but there needed to be something more like the DNS protection uh, to protect when, a fail, when a, a, an employee clicked on a phishing email to block that infection. And so when we, what we did is we designed a Neoscope Shield, which is a conglomeration of all these eight steps in a package for our customers to be able to address their most critical and sensitive data and the threats and vulnerabilities against that data. So let's talk about all eight of these items. The Neoscope Shield starts with a security assessment. 
It includes access to the policy services website. That's that database that automates and saves your HR or your office admin just 10 times the labor and enables you to pass audits. We have on-site and online security awareness training for the clients purchasing the Neoscope Shield. And then, of course, we have all of these different technology protections in place when, when and where it's appropriate. So any company for which we have email support, they have an anti-spam solution in place. Every company that has IT management support has an antivirus in place already. To that, we're adding the DNS web protection, the advanced web protection, and content filtering if you need that. There's two levels, silver and gold. Silver is just the malware protection. Gold includes malware and content filtering. We also, for those companies that do have a large mobile device management infrastructure, we offer them the um, MDM solution, three, MAS360, and data encryption and multi-factor authentication uh, round out it for those customers that might have critical data on laptops. Uh, we certainly want to see those laptop hard drives encrypted. And multi-factor authentication when you have work from home employees accessing, say, HIPAA data, for instance. That's a, uh, an absolute must is to have multi-factor authentication. Not every client needs the last three items in this list, but one through six they most definitely do. And that's a standard set, of, uh, set of, of offerings within the Neoscope Shield. Seven and eight are optional depending on a client need based on, based on that risk assessment saying, yep, we have data on laptops and on iPhones or iPads. They're going out into the community, and we want to protect them. So we're going to encrypt them. We're going to require remote access, multi-factor authentication, those sorts of things. All right, here, here's another view of the Neoscope Shield. We've got the uh, risk assessment, antivirus, email security, web protection, policy compliance, security awareness. Of course, you can read all of this, but one of the things I want to draw your attention to is the CSO consulting. Uh, as part of the risk assessment, when you have a paid risk assessment engagement as the first step, uh, we include the information security newsletter, breaking news, and best practices, as well as annual CSO planning meetings. Both of those come free of charge, access to me, uh, when you do that risk assessment. Of course, I'm still going to send out notifications like we did just recently with the um, Windows 10 phishing scheme to make sure that our clients are not impacted by that, that they know not to click on those you know, zip file attachments purporting to be a Windows 10 free upgrade. Um, so this is, this is what we get with the Neoscope Shield. So that's enough said about that. Uh, let's move on and, and uh, close the conference presentation uh, for the day. I'm going to turn it back over to Matt here. I want to thank folks before I do uh, for listening to me for the last 45 minutes and uh, we'll open it up to um, any questions that might be out there. Yes, yes. Very good presentation, Craig. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a couple questions. Let me just run down the list right now. So Michael asks, shouldn't my managed IT plan already cover information security? And what makes the managed security offer that you offer different than that? Oh, great question, Michael. So the, the big deal about information security is that it's always changing, right? Sun Tzu in The Art of War, he said, you have to always know what your weaknesses are, but you don't just do it once, right? That risk assessment and where we are today in the security world that we live in now in 2015 is very different from what it was even a year or two ago. Three years ago, there wasn't crypto wall infections, crypto locker infections. Uh, phishing was certainly a problem, phishing emails and, and people being compromised, but antivirus was mostly keeping up with those, with those attacks. Today, the antivirus vendors aren't, just aren't keeping up, as my slides alluded to, and so we have to up the protective defensive game that we have, the defense in depth approach to securing uh, the businesses that Neoscope supports, and the answer to how we do that is the Neoscope Shield. We do the policy governance and compliance there because we're being audited and we need to prove to other companies we have a good security program. We do the security awareness training on top of what a normal IT business would do to help prevent that first click from actually occurring. Uh, and then we add DNS protections on top of that to make sure that 
even when we train and provide governance and policy, uh, policy governance, even then when an employee clicks, eight out of 10 times we prevent that malware infection. And then we ensure on the back end you've got backups to recover if there is a crypto locker infection. So to answer the question, yes, IT, will, normal traditional IT management includes the spam, anti-spam, the antivirus, but that's no longer enough. We have to up our game to protect our resources because the hackers have changed their attacks and they're more sophisticated today than ever before. Back to you, man. Awesome. Okay. Okay, wait. Patricia asks, how do I communicate these, I'm assuming, security measures to my staff, policy-wise, I'm assuming? Yeah, so the first thing that happens in the, the uh, Neoscope Shield implementation is a meeting of senior management to understand what's going on. We're going to do the risk assessment. We're going to introduce these different policies. Um, email is sent out to all of the employees at a company saying you can expect to see uh, the employee handbook maybe split out into separate policies, one for you know passwords, one for a written information security policy if that's what's needed for mass residents, etc. And it's just introduced through an email from the HR representative or the site, site administrator to the employees to say we're up in our game, here's what we're going to be doing. We're also introducing open uh, DNS protections because we want to avoid 8 out of 10 infections if someone still clicks a link after being trained. We talk about this during the training when I come on site and assign the online training to all the employees. So there's many opportunities for us to communicate all of these changes to employees. The more communication, the better the adoption of the security best practices and the understanding of the employees. So communication is a big thing and it's it's central to this whole rollout of the shield. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. Okay, Sarah wants to know what makes a strong password? Oh, what makes a strong password? We spend a significant amount of time talking about strong passwords uh, in the training. Um, so I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but passwords you know, an eight-character totally randomized password today can be cracked in about one second. It's unfortunate but true that hackers have access to really, really cheap but very effective password cracking machines. Uh, they can turn on GPUs, the, the graphics processing unit in computers now to do password cracking. Um, so the best advice for a strong password is to use a password manager that allows you to set random passwords that are between, you know, I'm using 14 character passwords because I'm, I'm a security guy. I think everybody should be using 14 to 16 character passwords cut and paste out of a password manager. There's free ones out there. LastPass is a free password manager. There are others that Neoscope offers to its clients from AuthAnvil. Um, but use a password manager and make it long. That's the best advice for a strong password and random, if you can. Uh, we get into mnemonics for how you can create a memorable password for your password manager. Because remember, you can't. You have to set a very strong but memorable password on your password manager. Um, that's about all we have time to get into today for passwords. Is there any other questions, ma'am? Yep. Okay. As a business owner, oh, who said this one? Kyle asks. As a business owner, what should my security priorities be? So that's a great question, and uh, I hope I made it very clear in this presentation that the first and most important step is the risk assessment. If you, if all the small businesses that I deal with have very tight budgets, and so you want to get the most bang for the buck that you have to spend, there might not be many bucks to spend. So without the risk assessment, you don't know what your greatest risk is what the most likely uh, threat or vulnerability is to occur uh, that would have the biggest impact to your business, right? So once you have that risk assessment, that really provides you a roadmap for the next two to three or five years on where you're going to need to spend some investment dollars, where you need to plan and budget for investing. It used to be uh, years and years ago that the IT budget was sort of an afterthought. Most businesses today have a regular budget item set aside for IT 
support, refreshing machines and servers and application purchasing applications. Um, today, though, people don't have that line item for security spending necessarily. Within the next two years, I think every business, if it wants to stay in business, given the facts that I presented today, has to have that line item, which is their IT security budget and what they're going to invest in based on that risk assessment. So those two things, having a risk assessment that drives a budget for the future is going to be critical to, uh, to where to start for most of the small businesses we, we, we deal with, Matt. Okay, so it looks like we have one more question. Okay. All right. So Brian asks, where do you get your security news and updates from? Great question, Brian. So there's a lot of good sites on the Internet. One of my favorite, favorite uh, emails that I get every day and I read it religiously is the Sophos Naked Security blog. And this basically summarizes the top three to five or six, if it's a busy news day, security articles. Uh, recently I read about how hackers took over a Jeep and stopped it, uh, it, it put, turned the brakes on and pulled the Jeep over remotely via the cell phone that's in all Jeeps, all 2015 Jeeps, uh, and how they cracked into it or hacked into that. You know, there's all kinds of interesting articles about the future of, uh, of, of security there, breaking news on this Windows 10 uh, phishing email scheme, that sort of thing. So Sophos is one area. Um, there's other websites out there. Uh, if you just did a quick Google search on security news, you might see Ars Technica is another website, A-R-S-T-E-C-H-N-I-C-A.com is a great site for um, collection, collecting all sorts of different information security art news articles. I also have a couple of paid subscriptions that I use um, to uh, things like Windows Secrets that goes over, you know, common everyday security best practices, uh, and uh, of course I read up on a lot of the different vendors. I participate in their early notification around patches from Microsoft to Oracle to you name it. I, I'm getting patches and, and security news that way as well. All of those are good practices for getting security news, but if you purchase the Neoscope Shield, you'll get some of those newsletters sent directly to you, so uh, a little plug for that. Shield product that we have here at Neoscope. Back to you, Matt. Okay. So it looks like that was our last question. Okay. So let me check. So One more second. I'll put you. I'll put you on the last slide then, Matt, and you can close us out. Okay. One second. I think we might have one more question. Okay. All of our policies and SOPs are kept on our network drive. Does Neoscope take and upload our SOPs to this policy site? Um, what if they need to be edited later on down the line? And that was asked by okay. Chris. Okay, Chris. Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. So, yeah, we work together. The, the software as a service website, policyservices.com, is uh, takes a PDF version of your policies and puts it into um, everybody's uh, a link to it uh, to all of your employees so they can click the link and get access to the site to read the policy, type their name in, and that that and then click the I accept my responsibilities button so that we know we we record the name, the IP address, uh, and the date and time of the user at your company that accepted a policy. Now your question was, what about changes to that policy? The way the site works is, if you make a material change to that policy, then all of the acceptances to that policy become null and void, and they have your employees will have to re-accept the policy. So it resets their window of acceptance, like usually it's 30 days to accept a policy. Now, the advantage of this site is that it also sends out a, a reminder to the manager or owner of that policy 90 days before it's up for its annual renewal. So the way this normally works is you upload your PDF, say it's a password policy, you make sure you've got all the signatures on it that say it's fully approved by uh, company X, and then you assign it to your users and they get an email and they get 30 days to click the link in that email and read the policy and accept it. Uh, 
nine months later, you, the administrator of that policy, get an email saying, hey, that password policy is going to be due for uh, renewal by all the employees to read and re-accept it in 90 days. Do you want to make any changes to it? Gives you the opportunity to update the Word version of it, uh, save it as a PDF, upload it, and then on the you know on the annual annual date, uh, the new policy goes into effect, and your employees have to sign uh, accept the new policy. If you're doing uh, if you follow the templates that we provide at Neoscope, you've got a change log that outlines the material changes that makes it a lot easier for your employees to see what the material changes from last year were so they don't have to go and read through the entire thing, although it's a good refresher and many employees will do that anyways. So I hope that answers the question about how you manage changes within the policy services website. Um, it's also configurable, I should add, that you can have an employee download the policy once they click the acceptance button to their desktop or email it to themselves. Uh, but you can turn that on or off, that ability to email the policy administratively, depending on whether you have critical or sensitive information in your policy. Some do, some don't. You, uh, you can certainly turn that feature on or off. Mm. Any other questions, Matt, or follow-up? No. Mm. Give it one more minute, or one more second, just to see if anyone. Okay, but I All think right. we are good, yeah.